Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. Beautiful day to be out and hear some good weatherization, insulation, air sealing. Uh, there will be a tour next door of uh, Tom and Lori Silva's house um, in the basement, not the rest of the house, but just the basement. Uh, and after that will be a tour presentation by Mark Schneider. Mark is here someplace. Mark, raise your hand. There's Mark. Um, so Mark will do a presentation at 2.15 uh, in the house next door on that side, Eric and Ann Hansen's house. And at 3.30, uh, if you're really up for more fun, uh, up, up just off the common, there's some signs too on the west side of the common going down um, uh, Mountain Hill R Road, uh, <laughs> if you can remember all that. Um, there's a, another presentation of a new house. These two are obviously old houses. That'll be a new house. Uh, and a tiny house along with it. Uh, so very exciting afternoon. Busy. Uh, but I hope you can make the whole journey. I'm here to test him out and then make sure the work was done to efficiency mod standards, which is important because we want it to be functional and safe. So I'm going to be very excited. He did a lot of work. He's going to take you through because he was the, the lead guy on this. He was point. And all I'm going to do is blow a door test, which you're welcome to watch. We'll grab a number. I'll minus that from the initial number. And then we'll know what the percentage of savings was. On this job, I'm hoping for um, considerable reduction in air leakage, which will mean he's going to be more comfortable and use less fuel. OK. So I did a lot of these tours. That the Crassberry and Albany and Glover and all that, just to kind of get a feel for it, knowing that we wanted to do this house. And then um, we hired Mark and he actually did the audit. So he provided a several page document that went through air sealing, insulation, moisture issues. And we went through that step by step and picked out what can we do, what can't we do, what can we afford, what can we do half job at, what can we do a full job at. And so that was critical in making sure that we do it right. And hopefully we did do most of it right. Um, and we did do uh, some things to the full, like the cellar, totally spray foam by uh, American Foam, Richard Gravel. Um, so I made sure that you know he was all on board doing that right. But we didn't. We did sort of a partial job in the attic, where we didn't foam everything up there to seal it. We did edges, um, and then we did the cellulose, and we did fixtures with foaming to air seal up there. So we'll go kind of go through that as we go. Um, before we go inside, you know, some of the other issues you want to deal with is, is drainage and moisture around the house, especially if you're foaming um, and air sealing the cellar. So we have a crawl space in the front, a full cellar in the middle, another crawl space. Dirt floors, 1834 was the date of this house. The kitchen was added on in 1900. So there's, you know, we, we discovered some weird walls that we didn't know existed and airflow through those walls. And we probably still miss some. But um, hopefully we, we got most of the way there. So one of the things was when they put this paved driveway in, the drainage is horrible. You get a big storm, water goes into the cellar. Not a lot, but enough that you don't want to do that with spray foam on the walls. So we put in a French drain, it drains out here. I'm actually going to expand it a little bit because the July 10 rain last year over did the system and we got, got, did get moisture in. So we had a dehumidifier going all, all summer and spring into the fall. Um, hopefully it's OK. Um, but we'll find out. Um, I think that's pretty much all we need to talk. Oh, we're going to add some gutters, rain gutters, in some of the bad spots to make sure that water gets away from the house so it's not flowing into the old foundation. This is uh, the Crossberry uh, stone with a little orbicules in it. What do you call it? Bullseye granite. Um, and then some old cement foundation under the kitchen. Um, there we actually had to build a false wall because there was actually a whole part of the kitchen that had no wall under it. The only insulation was the floorboards and three layers of linoleum. Um, and no wonder our food was freezing in the closets and things like that. So we'll get to see that after we ripped out all that linoleum and discovered a nice maple floor. So we're um, getting, getting that to go. I'd like to add one thing to that. We wanted to foam the basement. I generate work scopes which tells him what needs to be done and what it might cost. We wanted to foam the basement and air seal it, but we can't when they're wet. So first things first, oftentimes we work with on drainage to get the water to move away from the building, to dry out the basement, so then we can do our work. So you might want to do the insulation and air sealing first. Oftentimes you'll have to do other things first to make that work correctly. 
All right, there's a, a lot of us. I think we can all squeeze in there to the cellar. Try to stay on the rubber mats because um, we're standing on a, a air sealed or moisture barrier. It's 20 mil plastic, so it's pretty tough stuff. We opted for 20 mil instead of six mil because we're walking on it, but I still put rubber down. So just find a little spot and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there when we get down there. When you get down there, you can look into the two different crawl spaces. We opened up the walls. So that is now our access. Before we had to access through a little hole right there, which is now sealed. Um, and so now that's all kind of indoor space rather than it was outdoor space prior to us sealing all this up. So you can look into those places, there's lights on, um, and then we'll kind of go through the whole cellar process. So let's make our way down. We'll move our way up to upstairs after. And... Okay, so in, my in-laws are going to be moving in here this summer uh, from, from Derby Line. So one of the things we did was sort of gut the kitchen and make it a, a nicer space with new lights, new ceilings, new walls, and we, they wanted a new beadboard. And while we were doing that, we realized the old lath and plaster was kind of falling apart. I'm like, oh, that's not that much. We take it down, there's no insulation in any of the walls, so we put about three inches of foam board in there and then foamed all that, sealed it tight. Um, the windows were actually done like 15, 20 years ago by uh, a friend of mine who's a contractor because they were single pane, rattling, um, rotten, and it was just time to replace them. We probably should have done more at that time, but um, we, we just couldn't afford it. So that's what those are from. Um, what did you replace them with? What brand of the window? These are Marvin's. Um, Why Marvin? Why not Anderson? Or... At that time, it was just what our contractor, oh. you know, double pane. And then um, this summer, or two summers ago, uh, Kevin and I swapped that window out with a triple pane. Um, those sills were finally starting to rot from all the rain coming off the gutters. So we're going to act no gutters. So it would drip in and they were rotting at the base. So it was just like time to replace those. Um, so that and that one was just uh, um, we got that RK Miles, a, comp a small company that does three pane, um, and a window like that was fifteen hundred bucks. Um, so and let's see anything else in here. Um, oh, when when we opened up the walls to there, I could actually see into the other room <laughs> behind everything. Like it was totally open air to the flat lap and plaster. So we kept going into that room and did two walls in there to a beam, or a vertical beam, or a post, and then we stopped. And then someday maybe we'll get more cellulose into the rest of the house in the living room in the front. Um, when we had these windows done, um, our friend Kevin did, or uh, Sean Eklund, did blow some cellulose by putting, taking clappers off, putting a hole in, and then forcing the cellulose in. And he did most of the north wall. Um, so at least that's, that part is done. Um, yeah, when you come around here, this is this old, we made it into a cupboard, but it was a stairwell at one point. And um, that's where we found like a, a whole cavity in there. Kevin was working on putting a light in. This is three weeks ago, and he felt a breeze at the light switch. So I went upstairs into the attic here, and I went through the five to six inches of cellulose fiberglass that was existing below the floor up there, and I found open gaps in a whole wall, about eight feet long going down. Um, so I was able to seal the top of those with wood, buy two more or three more cans of spray foam, and just seal all that up. So now that's interior space. But that was a, a lucky find. Whereas if we hired somebody to come in and remove all the cellulose, put a big layer of foam, spray foam up there, probably would have found all those gaps, but it was going to add ten to fifteen thousand dollars to the cost to have that done versus the way we did it. So we should look at so that. You just got to sure see where you're at for, for finances. Uh, um, so you're, for essentially, the air sealing is the sheet rock, it's and the taping and so forth, and not so much, not the spray foam that can happen. Right. We upstairs. I'll just talk about it now because we're easy. You know, while this is running. We did spray foam around the edges of the, this whole attic space to seal the tops of all the walls so the air is not flowing through the walls into the attic or attic into the walls. And so that'll just make it all tighter at the seams. And so it's a, a much tighter um, space. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked really as well. I guess we forgot to mention, this is a single story right here. Yeah. Two story there. And so that's why we're air sealing right here. 
Uh, Eric also spray foam the light fixtures after they were in to uh, air seal those in. Yes, what we did, what you did for reduction. This is the exciting part, folks, because we work hard. <laughs> We make educated guesses. I remember Mark saying that a typical house at, I don't know if this is like two and a half thousand square feet or something like that, is like a, it should be like 2,500 to 3,000. One square foot of surface in a floor area should be like one cubic foot of leakage on an average normal house. Not by a German standard, but by a sloppy American standard. So that would make this 2,500. This house was at 6,100. Wow. So it just tested out at um, 2,790, wow. which is a 55 percent reduction in air leakage, wow. which is outstanding. That being said, where is this 2,090 square feet or cubic feet coming from? Because by German standards, it should be zero. By American standards, it should be like 60, and it's 2,000. 790 cubic feet per minute leakage, which is a dramatic reduction from 5,000, from 6,178. So over half reduction, fabulous. But where is the, where are the rest of the leaks? Apparently there's one he found in the basement. If you stand in the basement door, there's a breeze coming up the basement door, when we're down in the basement, it's coming out of a vent in the chimney. There's like, <clears throat> so you're just got this massive airflow that's coming right back in the house down your chimney right now. So we would like to seal that up. And so what this fan is doing is it's drawing air out, depressurizing this envelope, because the house is like an envelope. Boundary, thermal boundary. And it's creating leaks that represent or are similar to a wind pushing on the side of the house at 20 miles an hour. And then it's hooked up this little machine here, which measures the cubic feet per minute and a certain pressure. So then this tool, the blower door setup, could be used to go around and look for further air leakage pathways. Where is it coming from? So it's a diagnostic tool, but it's also a tool to tell us how and what state the house is in. Some people call this the red door of truth because it's, it's honest and it's scientific and it's calibrated and it's the same every single time. Wouldn't matter who ran it, so long as they knew what they were doing, the results would always be the same. Very accurate. So if you're a scientific geek, like I've turned into, this is pretty exciting stuff. And congratulations for you and your team. Yeah. There could be, I don't know how that is the sealed on that. We added that in, it was a chimney that was for propane, because we had a propane heater unit stove. It was both a heater and a stove. Um, it's still gonna be, um, we're putting in a more modern propane that doesn't have to go through a chimney that way. Um, but we added that as part of the moisture issue, ventilation, make sure we get, reduce the moisture buildup potential. We've also added bath fans um, downstairs where the shower and bathtub are. Um, and so that, that should make a big difference. Um, and for that one, we actually put it on a timer switch. You can keep it on for 20 minutes or half an hour after you get out of the shower when there's still a ton of moisture in there versus just when you leave the room um, and don't get rid of that moisture. So that's something that I think is, is good. So let's dispel one myth and then there's more to see. There is absolutely no such thing as too tight. Could a space shuttle be too tight? Or a nuclear submarine? No. The house can't either. It wants to be tight to hold the heat in and it needs good mechanical ventilation. So we've tightened this up, we've added ventilation, we've made indoor air quality better, um, and it's and it's within acceptable norms now of leakage. Considering it's an old antique farmhouse that was built to the standard of, we had no idea what air leaks were. I mean, we knew they existed, and we still have probably over half to two thirds of the walls that don't have insulation in them, yeah. and no air sealing on those. It, you know, just even the ones that we added cellulose, there's still no actual vapor barriers or anything like that. Okay. Okay. Front hall. We could do this to your house. Well, I'll just do a quick introduction here. Our host, Matt Moody. 
Paula Davidson. This is their space. They built everything you see here, all off grid. And all right, take it from there, man. <laughs> Well, hello. Welcome to the tiny house in Craftsbury. Uh, we're up at Craftsbury Common today. And this is a 14 by 18 load-bearing timber frame. And then it's got a skin on the outside. Um, so it has a, a small efficiency kitchen uh, with some IKEA cabinets. Um, we're off grid here, so the refrigerator and the Lunos fan um, ventilation system is all on DC power and that comes over from the batteries in our house. And the fan is where? Oh, and there, the yeah, I have the Lunos fan here and then there's a, a second one upstairs and yeah. so they work in pairs. Yeah, nice. And those are directly off the batteries in our house and then uh, everything else is wired like a normal uh, house. And yeah. so it's super tight. Um, I do have a gas range in here because we're off grid. And so we have a vent hood that we have to use when we when we're cooking, and the place is so tight that I actually have to keep a window cracked open in order to use the vent hood properly, because otherwise it can't ventilate at all. It, it won't even push the flap open because it's too too tight. So that's something to think about if you ever make a tight place: is the makeup air for a yeah. vent hood or other things like that. Um, our water system is through the town water system, so we're lucky not to have to pump water. And that's about it. Uh, yeah, how about we make our way outside now? We'll okay. We'll get a view of uh, the upstairs. On demand water here. It's in this cabinet. Yeah, let me get a picture. And I'll just get out of your way. We can pop the door off if you need to get in there and take a look. Hello? Uh, the tiny house has kind of a unique foundation and one thing I was trying to do was I was trying to get away from concrete. Concrete has a ton of energy and volume in it when they make it and so uh, before a house, before a house, if you take a, an efficient house, before it ever even gets lived in, it's got tons of energy that's been expended just to make it, especially if it has a big concrete foundation. So one of the things I was playing around with with this tiny house was um, I decided to make what's, what I call a slab without a slab. So I, I did a frost protected setup where I had, and I've got a slideshow going on the inside that you can watch. Um, it has a, you know, like a flat area, you put a layer of foam down, two, uh, just two inch foam, and then I put a, a layer of uh, crushed stone down because crushed stone is nice for um, it kind of locks together and, and gives you a really solid base then I put some pressure treated timbers on that and and then filled in between the pressure treated timbers there's just a box of uh, eight by eights and I filled in with that with stay mat so that kind of locks the whole base right in place and then I went over that with a floor system of two by tens and and then regular Advantech and went up from there. So so that that particular place is just sitting on the ground and it and it's got a skirt of foam that's that's out underneath it and all the way out a little bit about four feet and that keeps the frost from getting underneath just like a deep foundation would and so it just sits there and and it's pretty perfectly stable and the other benefit is it's a, it's a nicely insulated floor so it's got a lot of rock wool inside the floor joists and then there's the whole foam underneath it so it's well insulated. Um, we, we moved here in 2019 and I'm a builder I've been a builder for many years I, I sort of I enjoy doing timber framing most, more than almost anything else uh, but I do all kinds of stuff and so um, we've always built our own places so we had a homestead in Cabot and then we came over here all the time to ski and we met a bunch of people and all my work moved over this way and so we decided that well maybe we should live in Craftsbury which turns out to be a really good decision because it's a great place to live. So we started in 2019, uh, moved here with our tents and this little gypsy wagon, and uh, or a bardo, and spent the summer kind of roughing it while we built this. And then we moved in in the nick of time, just like everyone in Vermont does. 
and kind of we had we had two boys that were teenagers at the time so there were four of us in here it's 14 by 18 on the inside and it has a loft and you guys are welcome to take a look as you move around and uh, so then we worked on the house from that point on and then uh, eventually moved into the house but the our goal was to stay out of our own way until we had the house really ready to move into because one of the things I've made a living at for many years is finishing people's places that they <laughs> moved into with their children and never got done so yeah it's a good living so anyway uh, I, I have um, done a few houses that are considered high performance houses in the past and so they they're super tight they're ventilated um, they have energy saving features and so we, we were kind of interested in doing the same thing here so uh, this ha this place is built like a what they call a monopoly house so it's it's a timber frame it's got a stick frame on the outside because stress skin panels are super expensive and I'm it's my own labor so I I did the labor and my wife helped me uh, all the time so we built the frame closed it in with a two foot on center stud two by sixes and then we wrapped it with zip bar which is kind of like this green product here with a uh, foam on the inside and then you tape all the seams and and that laps right up onto the roof I don't have zip bar on the roof but I do have it uh, sheathed and then it has an ice and water shield that, that ties down right onto the zip so the whole thing is completely sealed at that point right down into the floor I even tape the, the seams on the floor and uh, that makes a, an extremely airtight building and so all the timbers that you see on the outside are actually just applied afterwards because I wanted to have the part of the problem with a timber frame is you you walk up to a house and it looks really boring and it might be an amazing timber frame inside but you can't tell because there's nothing to show you or give you a taste of that so I I stuck some things on on the outside to give you that feeling mm. and uh, but the timber frame is completely isolated from the outside so there's thermal breaks for the whole building uh, there's hardly any wood that goes all the way through so uh, we use things like um, these are vinyl windows from Coltec and they're they're triple glazed some of them are low solar heat gain so if it's a west facing window where the sun's like blazing in in the summertime it it prevents the house from heating up as much um, let's see uh, we're off grid here so we started with a wood stove in this building when we were living there but we're going to rent it out pretty soon and so that uh, I had to switch out to a gas like a gas log uh, stove made by Lopi and so that the nice thing about it is it's it's automatic nobody has to keep feeding it or and, it, and the, one of the problems with a tight house is you, especially if you have a wood stove you can have issues with smoke um, we have gas range because we're off grid. So if we have a vent hood that we religiously use in our houses, and Matt. when you turn on the vent hood and don't uh, come on oh, in, <laughs> when, when you uh, if you turn on a vent hood while you're cooking and and your stove is not drafting really well, you can suck st you know stuff right out of the stove. Um, in the main house here, I have a wood stove, but it's but it's uh, it's got a um, outside air intake, and so that helps a lot, but it still can be a problem. So. Um, so in this place, we would keep a window open, even in the winter, and uh, that way we could monitor our makeup air. Um, another thing that we did was we have Lunos fans, which are, it's a system where you use two fans. I don't know if you ran into this at the other houses that you toured, but it allows you to, depending on how big the space is, how much fresh air you want, you put in a, a series of pairs of fans. and. One of them's always blowing in while the other one's blowing out, and then every 70 seconds they reverse, and they're moving the air through a ceramic core, and as the core gets, as the air, the warm air from inside goes past it, it warms it up, and then when it reverses, the, the warmth of the core gets uh, distributed to the air as it comes back in. So it, it, it's called a balanced ventilation system, so it's always pressurizing the house the same way, and it's always saving the energy if it's a if it's a cold winter day it saves your heat from getting lost and it if it's a nice hot day then it, it also keeps the house cool while still providing you fresh air so which is really important in a super tight house um let's see I'm trying to think if there's anything else we need to do. is that similar to an erv then it is it's it's actually um the lunos fans are considered an hrv so I think an ERV actually 
uh, save some of your moisture. Right. In our case, we don't really need to do that because their Lunos fans are sort of a feeble um, uh, fresh air exchange compared to like a bigger whole house ventilation system. So they do work, but they're not as robust as and, and the air. Um, what I'm trying to say, I, th I think that they um, still do the same job. Though, they do the same yeah, job. Yeah. yeah. So. So I have solar panels. And so we have a, like a lot of people you see have a, a, a system from Suncommon or one of these companies. And you might have a system like that that's grid tied. They might have like 8,000 to tw over 20,000 watts of solar power coming in. Because we're off grid and we have to um, process all that power ourselves, I have 4,880 watts. And so we can live on this property pretty well with that amount of energy because everything's kind of designed to run as, as quietly and cleanly as possible or, you know, not use a lot of power. Especially so. the, the refrigerators are DC powered yeah. and, and highly insulated. So things that use high power we either don't have in our house or we have a version that's uh, as efficient as you can get. Yeah, and then we cut out stuff like, um, you know, our original intent was to build a grid-tied house here, but then we talked to Hardwick Electric and we got the bill or the, uh, the quote, <laughs> yeah, the estimate, and, and we were like, wow, you know, we've lived off-grid for over 20 years before this, and it was fine, and we looked at the price that they wanted, and I'm like, wow, for that price, I could have the solar power system of my dreams, and so we decided to stay off-grid. That's, that's nice for us, but if you try to sell your house someday, the banks don't like it. Um, it gets you in trouble that way. The insurance company might not like it, you know, so there's some issues with that, but we really like it. And we tend to stay in one place for a long time. So and we've that, been able to yeah. have our insurance still. So that's yeah. <laughs> with a lot of back and forth with the insurance company. Right. Yeah, we still have so you have to, you have to consider that kind of stuff if you're going to do that. You have to that. for a cash buyer if you have a crazy off-grid house sometimes, right? Yes. You know going in that it's not yep. going to stand up to work really well. Right? Exactly. So the, a lot of banks will not. Yes. And again, yes. I mean, that person has a lot of equity going yes. in. You have know, yeah. 90% mortgage, okay? But if you have 50% or something, you might. You know. yeah. yeah. So so when we sold our place in Cabot, it was all off-grid. It was a, a beautiful homestead, and we did have to find some buyers that were like that so and this was pre-pandemic so people weren't beating our door down we really worked to sell that place and now we think about what we could have gotten for it and it's <laughs> gone so anyway now, maybe you could let some people some people could go in and yeah. you could explain to them what they missed because they yeah. missed the first okay. part where did you here. put your batteries they're in the main house so we'll see that so you've got a cabinet there. somewhere with a bunch of batteries they're down in the basement in a, in a control room yeah so another thing that we do is um this house this tiny house has uh, uh, an on-demand water heater so there's a it's in the bathroom in the cabinet and it's a gas fired on-demand water heater and then we have a gas range and a gas heating stove that i converted and so the uh, uh tank the other house uh, I can go in and answer any questions for people inside. Get distracted. And your neighbors here are off the grid? No, that's Addie Lou, and she's she's on the grid. So and it was too expensive well, to go from there to there. It has to go. So up at the next house up here, there you'll see all these things sticking out just above his house, and that's where it would have had to come from. And they would have had to go underground because it's. Um, I didn't want to run a line right across that view because it's a beautiful view. And so I didn't want to make her mad. And the, and the, the whole road here is like ledge right under the road. So they were they told me that, oh, we're going to have to jackhammer up a trench. And then you're going to have to encase all the conduit in concrete all the way down, you know, wherever you go over something like that. So and wow. unless we could have gone across from our neighbor, you know, maybe, and he, you know, probably we could have done something. Get easement. Exactly. Well, so. if you get grid, is it tied? If the grid goes down, you're out of power. Yep. <laughs> sure. So which is a which is a big yeah. issue. Well, some people have a Tesla battery too. Sure. That happens, right? yeah. Like, yeah. 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 But the grid's not going to get any more dependable. Probably not. <laughs> so, we, you know, we'll hear everyone's generators up here, and we usually have power, unless I do something stupid, which I've been known to do. So, 
not. We usually have pretty good clean power here. And you this got way? a backup generator? I do have a backup generator, which up until this uh, spring, or early, well, I'll say this winter, I just had a couple of little 2,000 Honda generators, because I, I would use the generators maybe once in a while, you know, maybe once or twice a month oh, no. at the most. So I didn't really need them that much. Except for no. So uh, this house here is just a regular um, uh, I uh, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm losing it here. <laughs> it's, they're, they're ambic blocks. So they're basically foam blocks that you put together like Legos and then you pour it's an ICF foundation, so then you pour a, a concrete foundation inside of it. And so they make, they're, they're your forms, and then they become your insulation after you strip all the support away. And so these are the R30 Ambic blocks that we are, use. Are those 8 inch? Or? They're, uh, they're more like 14 inches, okay. so they're pretty thick. All together, all together. With yeah, because it's an 8 inch, right. eight inch foundation uh, concrete, yeah. and then it's got some like three and okay, three and we, change we on each side. For the 12 inch. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> so I went. I went for the the beefiest ones they had because I wanted to, you know, have as much insulation mm -hmm. as I could. So, um, then the house that that whole base. So the walkout basement and just up to the first floor is the is the ICF foundation, and then from that point on, it's a hybrid of. Uh, timber frame that's load bearing just like that one. You'll see another one inside here that's about the same. It's just a little simple frame. And then some of the building is uh, a hybrid so that it's uh, it's resting on regular stick framing. So I have heavy timber rafters on regular stick framing. So the whole roof is all timber frame, but it's it's you know supported different ways. This house has uh, a lot more insulation in the walls, and so it's a it's kind of a double stud system. There's a, a two by six on the outside, and then there's some zip R six in the middle, and then on the inside I have what I call a service wall, which is just two by fours, and everything's two foot on center. And the service wall allows me to have wiring and elect, you know, and plumbing, or uh, not that I run plumbing in the outside wall much, but um, it allows me to do all that without having a um, penetration through the, the air barrier so this house was all sealed up just like that one was but that air barrier is inside the wall system and I did it that way because I wanted to try something out so yeah, I try some things out on my own but I would probably never build this detail for someone else because it, it performs really well and it does what I wanted but it was kind of expensive to do because of all the layers and then the pandemic happening and the building prices and so it was kind of a not the best decision in that case. That uh, interior 2 by 4 wall, is that insulated? It is. Okay, yeah. it is. Is there condensation coming through? Um, so in the, in this you, case... You've got the vapor barrier between the 2 by 6 and the 2 by 4 wall. And that was the, what I was wondering, but is there moisture coming? There's, there's moisture, on the, yeah. On the, so there is there is moisture in your warm air in the winter, and that moisture will get into the wall, but it doesn't... Uh, it, it never meets it, a cold. It, it can wall. never meet a cold enough spot to condensate, okay. so it doesn't turn into a condensate inside the wall system. So it, it'll it'll so make the humidity the insulation. comes up, but it, it, it never get up. Right. Yeah. There's no dew point inside the wall in this setup, <coughs> and so that's why the the exterior insulation you have to make sure that it's thick enough for whatever you have inside. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's some rules of thumb when you're mm -hmm. when you're reading about this. Right. Right. So that's how I set it up. Depending on how cold it's going to be outside in the winter. Right. Different form so there's no vapor barrier on the inside. There's no vapor barrier on the inside, um, other than the air barrier, which does have foam. And so that I guess you could think of that as a vapor barrier. The inside wall can always dry towards the inside because there's no vapor barrier, and the outside wall can always dry to the exterior. The so if either wall gets damp or whatever, it, it can it, it can recover every year seasonally. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So. Um, Let's see. That's this, actually the most important feature of like any wall. Like yes, it is. <laughs> That's true. So th then the, the building has two sets of sheathing. There's the Zip R6 in the middle. There's another set of sheathing on the outside, which is just some basic OSB. And then I strapped it. It has a building paper, like a um, the German Mento paper. And it's strapped with 1x4s, and then the siding's hung on, the, on that. <laughs> And so all the si all the siding is actually nailed into a really good nail base because the yeah. because it has a good amount of wood to, to land in. What is the siding made of? 
this is made of it's kind of like OSB it's a uh, it's made out of a chipped wood and then they they make it into a smooth product I should I don't uh, I don't know where Paula is do you want to get a piece of it up in the in the barn so it, it's kind of interesting because it's painted on this side but on the inside they don't paint it and that's I'm, I'm not even sure why but they don't paint the back side of it. it's it's LP smart side is the brand name so so it's essentially made out of a kind of wood. Right? It's a composite wood. It's really nice to work with. 16 foot lengths. They're all perfectly straight. Ooh, nice. And if you've ever done fiber cement before, this is way nicer to work with. I, I hate working with fiber cement. So it, it's, it's a... So like they have to glue the wood together to make it the thing, It's right? pressed together, yeah. So, so like plywood is. Yeah. yeah or, or OSB. It's like OSB. Yeah. She'll, she'll show us a piece. She'll go get one. Um, but there's no health hazards with it? Well, it's completely outside, so I don't, I'm not worried about my airspace with it. So I'm not breathing off gases from that product because it's completely outside the air barrier. So A lot it, of stuff they found now, some insulations and stuff that are good oh yeah. for your health, and that's why I wondered. But that's true. So well, when we're inside, out. remind me of that, and I'll tell you some of the things we did right. to, like the floor finishes and uh, all the woodwork is all, is all treated with some non-toxic... That's type finishes yeah so um do you you want to head in or um, do you, do you want to talk about drainage see the siding. sure it's got the name oh, yeah. on the back too uh drainage this um this this building is just sitting on a really well drained pad of of crushed stone and then there's sand below that so that's actually a really stable base this one is a regular conventional foundation so it's got um they dug down and because they pulled out some of these huge rocks, he had to backfill with some crushed stone. And then he actually brought a, a steamroller. I came home one day and there was an actual steamroller rolling around in the basement. And so it is the nicest surface I've ever worked off of because it was so packed. And, um, and then the guys that did the foundation built up off of that. So it has a regular footing, then the blocks to create the walls. And, uh, and then we have a conventional drainage tile around the whole thing, and it's, um, it's daylighted out in the field below us. Well, because you're on a hill, you, you don't have water getting in there anyway. Do you? I, had, I had one, this corner right here had one little trickle of water from, you know, the whole, you know, the whole, the whole common is like, you know, you dig a hole in the common and it turns into a, bat, into a swimming pool. Uh, we were really lucky here. We have a really dry site, and even our septic system, which is down this, the leach field is down in the system in the, field here is all uh, conventional septic so we're one of the few places in Craftsbury that has a conventional septic system which is one of the reasons we bought this property because it's it's a good you we could spend all our money on fill by building on a hill <laughs> so um, any other I go in sure what I'll, I'll say one more thing uh, one thing I left out is the roof system on both of these buildings what I did was I bought a truckload, like a whole semi truckload of recycled foam, and it was polyisocyanurate, and it came. It's kind of uh, the foam that they would use on shopping malls for for insulation for the roof. And when they tear a shopping mall down or redo the roof, they'll unscrew all that foam and then find a home for it from someone like me. So I I call up a dealer in Massachusetts that sells recycled foam products, and bought a big giant truckload of it, and it was really cheap. It was funky, but it's all, again, it's all on the outside of the air barrier. And, I, and it's the kind that I got was three inch layers and I, and I layered them up to about 12 inches for the roof. And so I have, because you saw, you looked at the ceiling inside, it's just boards. Mm -hmm. That's covered with grace, ice and water shield. And then that's my air barrier. And the nice thing about it is when you run fasteners into grace, it actually seals the penetrations really nicely. So. Uh, then I put my layers of foam on that, and then I ran some two by sixes flat on the top of the foam that's screwed into the timbers in both of these buildings. And that's what sandwiches it all together and holds it together. Then I sheathed over that with zip, like the zip, um, five eight zip, just like you do a conventional roof. And then I put my metal roofing on it. And the nice thing about that roof is it's, is it's very high very high insulation value it's like an r70 it's completely outside the air barrier so it never gets wet from from moisture or anything from the inside and and it's complete thermal break for the entire roof system all the way through so uh, it performs really well 
It wasn't very fun to do because the foam that we bought was recycled and it was funky. So it, it was it was kind of nasty to work with. But you it glue, was glue layers together. No, you just you, you just sandwich you them. sandwich them in. I didn't even bother to foam around each one. I just stacked them together tight. I overlapped the seams so that it, and and the reason is my you know I'm not worried about air movement through it. I'm more just wanting the continuous. And so I didn't spend money on tape, you know, trying to you know tape it together or anything. It was kind of it had a fiberglass sort of coating on it, and it was um, it wasn't something you could stick tape to or anything very easily. So and it was hot. When we put it oh, it was really hot. Yeah. <laughs> so it, what was the you said it was it was, it was polyisocyanurate. So it's the it's the um, you know the blue board that you see that the lumber yard. It's not that. It's a different kind of foam. And that leads me to the last thing. Uh, I told you about the floor system in this building for the tiny house. This building has a it has a um, seven inches of recycled foam, and then again this time it was um, it was uh, expanded polystyrene, and so that is underneath the slab in the basement, and so the the slab in the basement has about an R30 value underneath in insulation. And then there's a stego wrap, which is a really thick uh, plastic. Um, it's, a, it's like a super thick plastic that you tape together all the seams, and that's over the foam. And then they poured the, fount the uh, floor over that. So it, you'll see some of the yellow sticking up around the edges of the slab downstairs. And is anyway, that radon proof? Yes. Uh, in my slideshow, uh, this building has a grid of, of drainage tiles underneath the entire floor system every four feet. And it's perforated drain tile. It's in a bed of crushed stone, and it daylights out with the drain system that's around the perimeter. And it also has a vent on the outside, so the air passively comes in through the through the drainage vent, and then up through the through the side wall on the outside. That, that should take care of the water coming down the slope. Yeah, any water that gets in is always going to drain to daylight, and any and any, I ha it's basically open all the time, so it, air can move through and vent any radon that I have underneath. So I didn't, you know, this, this building is more just relying on being tight and sealed over the ground. This one's in the ground, so I have a radon system, yeah. And if I ever need to, I can hook a fan up to that pipe and then run the fan for it. If, if the passive system I have isn't good enough. So that's, Matt, yes. Would you say something about the five exhaust? Things that we oh see sure. On the all the penetrations you're worried about, right? No, not oh. at all. <laughs> um, that's it. That's an interesting thing. This, uh, these two are the water heater, and it's a regular, just a big 40-gallon propane water tank. And this one is a the dryer, and it has. I use these kind. They're they're from a company called Heartland, and the reason I use them is it's a cup on top of a pipe. And so when the dryer turns on, it actually floats and lets the air out. And I and the, you can modify them so that you can run a uh, a bath fan with it, which is a bath fan's kind of feeble compared to a dryer. So they just make a really good seal on a tight house when you're not using them, as opposed to the kind that's just a louver and it's always broken and the, you know the weed whackers killed it. So um, the other vent at the end down there, that's a a 22,000 BTU Renai heater. That's my backup heat, and I hardly use it. It's uh, it sits in the basement and it's ready to go in case I don't, you know, break a leg skiing and I have to uh, not use the wood stove or something for some reason. So that's my backup heat. Uh, we were talking about insurance and and selling your house a little while ago. It turns out that nowadays, when you build a house, they want ducted heat in every room, including in every bathroom. And so when you go to get your insurance, the insurance company doesn't see that and they're like, we're sorry, you have to be on a lower tier insurance. So if you're building a house, you have to plan on that. And uh, so we, we ended up, uh, we've had insurance with the same company for many years, so we're still okay as far as the coverage, but it's always an issue that they bring up and, and, they tr and they're trying to figure out ways to get rid of me, I think, because they don't, they don't like it. Even though it's a super insulated, super well, you know, you could heat it with really easily, uh, the insurance company doesn't like that. So, or, you know, if you put a heat pump in, they don't like that either. So, they Why want... they like heat pumps? Well, they want, they want regular, average America, you know. Even 
forced air heat all over the house kind of setup. Yeah, so it's not it's not so easy. Um, let's see, you know, of course there's the a faucet for you know for water in the garden and stuff like that. And that was the bath Yep. Yep, that's the bath fan. Same same vent, but you put a little spring on it so that it makes it a little bit lighter and it floats a little easier when it opens. Um, I think if you want to see the Lunos fans on the outside, there's one around the back of the tiny house that's, uh, that you could see. There's two, you know, two vents for the Lunos fans. This one has four Lunos fans because it's a bigger square footage. So you, you base that on how many square feet your house is. If it gets much bigger than this house, then you might have six Lunos fans. Then it starts to get kind of silly because you could buy a really good um, uh, whole house ventilation system with ductwork if you're going to have a house that needs that many Lunos fans because they're, they're, each pair of Lunos fans is expensive and if you get six of them, then you're, you're going to start adding up to a really nice ventilated system like you have, like a, a Zender or something like that or Brone or some, one of those brand names. Um, How expensive are the Lunos fans? They cost... Well, I haven't checked recently, but the, but they're usually like uh, what is it like a thousand dollars for a pair? It's it's like twelve twelve hundred probably for a pair of fans. Yeah, so they're not cheap. And they're pretty energy efficient. They say they are. My son is in engineering school, and he doesn't like the numbers that they run. So I don't know. You know, he doesn't have a lot of experience yet. So we're you know I'm not sure. <laughs> It, it's, they're, they're, they talk about them in a unit that he doesn't recognize. It's like a European measurement, and he's, it's not one that he recognizes or believes quite yet. But I will say the air quality in our house is usually, you know, just from my perception, it seems it's like the nicest house I've ever lived in as far as air quality. It's, all, it's always pretty, pretty clean. So, uh, Last thing I should mention is we do have a wood stove in this house, just like we did in that one. Uh, the because the house is so tight and and isn't that big, the uh, wood stove is a tiny house wood stove. So it's actually, I burn these little nine inch logs. And my friend Alan right here, he also has the same company wood stove in his place. I, I think it's one version, one smaller size, I think, don't you? So what floor is the wood stove on? It's on the first floor. So I'm the basement. The basement stays fairly cool. It's It's always like between 55 or 60 somewhere in that range sometimes the propane heater so, yeah sometimes the propane will run because i'll set it on low like it, it always stays at least 50 down there yeah we're not really living in the basement so it's not no but i mean you don't have to worry about freezing then. no it, it doesn't freeze like this the tiny house i could leave this winter for a few days at a time without starting a fire and i and it would get to 40 45 or 40 maybe and it, so I never really had troubles with that building freezing much either. I'd, I'd start a fire every few days, so it, it holds the, it holds its own pretty well, especially if it's sunny. Dedicated air intake for each of the stoves. The tiny house did not have that, and it and it was a problem. So if you if you ever set this up yourself, you really need a stove that has a dedicated air intake. The 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 <laughs> stove inside this house has its own air supply. What's the R value of the walls in the tiny house? That's probably like an R30. It's it's a five and a half inches of rock wool, and then zip R six. So that'll be twenty three and and six. Yeah. And then you, you let people in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's come on in. There's, there's a laptop. Our biggest problem with the pots is our son. People have been to them. We have a six eight son. Yeah. So he bangs into everything. <laughs> That's his problem. So uh, one thing to see, like in this case, the. Uh, the timbers are resting on a, just a stick frame, so they're resting on the 2x4 part of the wall. The 2x6 is outside of that, and the insulation from the 2x6 wall actually goes up past the timbers, so they never stick out, and they're never close to where they can get cold on the end and get wet, like you were thinking. Yeah, so they're always isolated. Um, is this side face west then? Is that's that directly west. west. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you get all the sun in here. It's, that's, the, um, that's a little awkward for a kitchen. In the evening, you're you're standing here and you're just getting blasted in the summertime yeah, yeah. until like 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. 
So you so could you could use curtains to keep the sun. You out. could, yeah. And then these are low solar heat gain windows because in the winter time the uh, the sun never really gets that far, and so but in the summer it keeps it a little cooler in here. So this this uh, any any windows facing west are low solar heat gain. The south facing ones are just regular. Uh, the north. I'm trying to think if there's anything about the north facing windows that I. Can, <laughs> All the windows and doors in this house are triple glazed. Um, again, they're the same company. It's Coltec, oh, which is a Canadian company. What do you mean by solar heat gain? They don't have the low E coating on them? They, they have a coating that um, when the sun is, it's it's like a low, a low E coating probably. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, a greater sun catcher than you're saying? No, it it's blocks the sun. It blocks the sun. Right, which isn't a problem in the winter because it never makes it in there through these windows anyway. It comes in through the south, but doesn't go far enough around the building. In the summer, it's coming right, you know, the sun sets like over there at night in the summertime. So it, you're, you're heating up the whole time that these windows are facing the sun. And so that's what the coating does. And uh, the thing that you would notice, if you had one of these windows right next to one of the south windows, you would notice that it's a, a little less light gets through because of that coating. So they are a little dimmer, I suppose. Um, and this, this house is the same timber frame as the tiny house? A little, it's, it's a little slightly, slightly different, different dimensions. Pretty yeah. much the same. But, but then we, so it's a hybrid we actually added. This part has timbers, but it's not, doesn't have a post. So, so this, this frame, like over you guys, this is, the frame is actually what's holding the house up. Over this part, the two by four walls on the inside part of that wall assembly is what's holding the, the frame. And the timber frame determined a lot of the house. Also, we were trying to build as small as possible. We started like even much smaller and then we kept, I kept pushing for a little bit more. Um, we probably, it would be even better to have like had six inches more. In some six cases, inches would have made a big deal. Um, yeah. The staircase, for example, was um, very hard for him to figure out because it's, because we're fitting it into a tiny space. And then our son designed and built the railing because it, it has to be highly custom because of the way the stair is. Um, so, so this whole room right here, what are the dimensions on it? It's like 13 and a half feet by um, probably 29.2. That, that would be the outside. outside. That's the outside length and the inside width. Sorry. Okay. So, so the inside width is about 13 and a half feet. The outside length of this of this space would be 29.2. Okay. And you and you wish that it was six inches. I wish it was six inches like that far. So it, yeah. I can't remember Catherine, why. There's a well, <laughs> like, like the bedroom door. You'll notice it goes just a little past the, the corner of the wall, mm -hmm. and just a little extra thing like that would would have made mm -hmm. it would have made a better spot for the door to land. And, and so the total footprint is. The total footprint is by is 28.6 by 29.2. So another thing I was trying to do from an efficiency standpoint was I, a, a square building is much more efficient than a mm -hmm. rectangle because there's a yeah. lot less yeah. exterior wall, wall space. Wall. Yeah, so that, that's something to think about um, if you're trying to build an energy efficient house. Uh, let's see, anything else we can... How, how is it, I know it sounds stupid, how is a timber frame different than a log cabin? Um, the, a, lo a, a log cabin, the entire thing would be built with, with heavy timber, yeah, timber and a timber frame is just, the, just the, the skeleton of something. So it's just, you know, like the posts and beams and, and some braces and rafters. So, uh, okay, floor, uh, since we're standing here, things like the window s stool caps or the window sills, uh, the butcher block countertop, this was a piece I salvaged out of a kitchen I tore out years ago and I carried it around for 15 years or something like that. And then the floor, those are all finished with non-toxic materials. So the floor is finished with a European oil called Rubio Monocoat and it's a really nice finish to work with. It leaves a matte finish and it's really easily repairable. So you don't have to move out of your entire first floor to refinish it. You could you could fix up like the kitchen on a weekend if you wanted to and then move on to something else on another time. So it, it's, a, it's a very easily repairable finish. The, um, the butcher block, the doors, any interior wood trim that's, that's bare, um, 
and the let's see the doors, the butcher block, though, and including this ca these cabinets. Those are all done with a product called Heritage Oil, and that's a company that makes a lot of uh, they make oils that a lot of timber framers use, and so even the even the timber frames coated with that oil, and that's a citrus based oil product, and it just it smells good. Both of those smell really good when you're working with them. They're not they're not uh, like a chemical smell. It's just a pleasant smell, and then it eventually drifts away, and you, you can don't. Use it on anyone. And you, you can it's food safe. Both both products you can eat off the floor or off the off the heritage <laughs> oil. Expensive. Kind it's of expensive. Work? Yes, but. Uh, with the Rubio Monocoat, you don't need very much to do the whole floor. So, like the, the whole floor in this house was done with a, with a bottle like this. It's not a very much material. So it is expensive per, per quart or whatever, but not really in, in use. Okay, what is this? I forgot. This is, this is uh, it's heart pine. It's, it's like a Honduran heart pine. So maybe not the best choice if you're trying to get local material. But... We liked it, and we both agreed that we liked it, so that was a big plus. <laughs> so, so what, it's wood, right? <coughs> what is it called again? What's that? What's the oil called? The, for, the, for the floor? The floor is called Rubio Mono Coat. It's R-U-B-I-O, and then Mono Coat. Um, oh, that's one coat of oil on it? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, single, wood, right? it's a single coating uh, system. So what you do is you, you have like a giant floor polisher, you sand your floor, and then you uh, clean it with a, there's a, like a, they have a solvent that they use that's sort of a non-toxic solvent. And then you, you mix that with water and you, and you mop it to sort of raise the grain. And then you sand it and then, um, I mean, you don't sand it again, but you're polishing it with a, with a polishing, a big polishing machine. And you're rubbing the oil into the fibers of the wood and it's smoothing it at the same time. So, and it's pretty easy to do, I, I think, compared to the three coats of, of polyurethane. Mm -hmm. And how long does it last? How long, you know, like, like how does it wear? It wears pretty well. I never, I don't take my shoes off very much, and yeah. so it, it lasts. I could see the some yeah, scratches where the cats do the going around yeah. the corner, <laughs> um, but then you, you went over it with just water or something? Well, I just mopped it a little bit today. You mopped it a little bit, and now it's harder to see. You can see up. where the chairs are. It's wearing out a little bit, mm -hmm. but again, if it gets a little worn out, I can, I can fix that up just to over, you know, as a as a as a chore, you know, right, instead yeah. of having to do the entire floor or hire somebody in, I can fix little areas that are getting worn. And when you oil it, like I'm, I'm really interested in this. <laughs> when you put that on there, how long do you have to stay off it before you can be lit on it again? It's like less than it's like 24 hours, I think. No, it wasn't that it's long. Not, it's very not very long. long, and it does have an odor to it, but it's it's a kind of a pleasant odor. It's not a it's not a chemical sort of odor. Right. And so. it doesn't stain easily. Uh, well, yeah. not not usually. I mean, the you cat. You stained it with coffee. The, so well, the cats know. will come in and they'll eat a mouse, and and before I can get to them, and there's blood on the floor. It doesn't leave a blood stain. Wow. And so that's kind of amazing to me. But I was slashing coffee around apparently, so I have a couple of coffee stains over here. <laughs> so that was me. But again, I could sand that a little bit and probably yeah. fix that. So. I'm I'm uh, too busy doing other things to do you know like regular maintenance. <laughs> so, um, the cat didn't share the mouse with you. No, she but she, I've got her trained to come in and eat it right on her tray. So, um, I should just mention that since we built our own house and we're in Vermont, you can do all of your own wiring and your own plumbing and all kinds of stuff for yourself. As a builder, I shouldn't do that for you guys. But I could build your house, but I shouldn't be doing your wiring or your plumbing. But we did all of our own plumbing and electrical, and including, you know, Paula helped me with the electrical quite a bit. Uh, she did a ton of insulating on this house, um, cut and carried all kinds of stuff for me while I was up on scaffolding. So we worked a lot together. And then um, the other thing is we, we built all of our own cabinets from scratch. The, you know, every bit, of, even the doors were built from scratch. So every built-in, all the cabinets, everything was all made, including the dining table. You know, that was a that was when we first got married. But it's it's truly a house that we made, you know, with our own hands. So we did all our. How long did it take? It took like uh, four years because uh, you know we were both working and and so we it took us a long time. Yeah, I did all the sheetrock. You know. <laughs> So, How hard was it to keep clean? The house? Yeah. 
it's not too hard. I mean, we did we did scurry around a little bit today we before you folks got here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just the two of us. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a lot harder when our sons are home. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> But because it's small, we like having a small house. Yeah, yeah. Small. Do, you, do you wish you had something like a pantry or something like that? Well, That's we had a little pantry in our old place. Yeah. You are well, in the we kitchen. we did have a pantry in our old place, and we tried and tried to figure out yeah, how to really fit that into the, that. Uh, the scheme of things. Yeah. So yes, we we kind of miss our old pantry. It was just it was like a little tiny closet, but it made a big yeah. impact on ours because we used to do a lot of. Um, and we hope to again, you know, now that we're here, we hope to do a lot of our own food. But in Cabot, she had huge gardens and canned a lot and yeah. Our I mean, goal it hasn't been so bad. I mean this is a deep cabinet. Uh, this is our canned food is here. Mm -hmm. um, most of this is more our uh, um, plates and things like that and recycling and so it's really yeah. I think we cut down and not, I don't buy as many varieties of you know, all the different grains you can buy and all that. Yeah. It's definitely simplified that. And then um, I have, right now I have one trash can in the basement that, that has like bulk flour and stuff in it. Mm -hmm. And once we um, are able to clean out our storage room a bit better, I, I would probably have storage for more. Like in, get back to buying oats in bulk and stuff mm -hmm, like that. I, mm -hmm. I would just store the bigger things in the basement. And it's like not too. it's not here, so you have to go get it, and so that's good for you. Mm -hmm. the, you know, when we were, here's something to keep in mind. When you're living in a tiny house, I, I always wanted to build a tiny house and live in it. Maybe not with four or three other people, but um, <laughs> when we were living in the tiny house and that was the only indoor space that we had in the wintertime, I think our fitness actually suffered a little bit because you get done in the evening and you see you know, there's nowhere to go. You just sit down and you're done, right? This house, you have to go downstairs to get this, go back upstairs to do that, you know, so you're always constantly going up and downstairs and you would not believe how much of a difference that makes to your fit fitness in a house. So it's not something to shy away from necessarily, unless your knees are bad. But. Do you have a freezer? We do. I don't have the freezer on right now because we just don't have enough uh, that we need to store that way.